Yes, I'm here to actually present our use case. Uh, I'm uh, a researcher at Fraunhofer IPK, the Institute for Production Systems and Design Technology. So uh, less less software focused, basically. So we're basically an application uh, 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 an application here. Um, and what we're dealing with a lot is, um, as the name kind of suggests, is production systems. But uh, I'm personally working in the uh, business unit virtual product creation a little bit of the uh, redheaded stepchild in our facility, but at the same time, what's really nice is a lot of access to uh, guys that deal a lot with later uh, product life phases. Um, and so what we're dealing with is to connect product development with things manu like manufacturing and assembly and so on. So for us, um, I particularly work in a work group that's, that's dealing with MBC a lot and simulation for us, it's always interesting to actually look beyond um, just the early, conceptional phase into also things like manufacturability and things like that and so on. Um, and we actually have um, basically constant need for demonstrators, uh, basically to demonstrate certain technologies. Um, usually what happens is that um, we use those for, um, uh, to uh, once we, whenever we we try to acquire industry partners or for research projects or something like that, we use them for educational purposes as well to have interns or um, basically uh, people that write their thesis work on those as well and contribute to those. So it's usually uh, a more of a uh, evolutional process, so to say. That's that's the positive thing. It, it sometimes can turn into a mess, but we we are usually quite good at managing that part. Um, so our use case here is actually that uh, we're going to deal with the with uh, hybrid electric propulsion. Um, this is all going to be a project that deals with a demonstrator aircraft there. I, I took something more neutral here as an example. This is basically by the uh, Association of the German Aerospace Industry. What we're dealing here, it's, it's actually fairly simple, at least in, in theory. It's just, we have a turbine that generates electricity. We have batteries that store power, enabling the turbine to function highly efficiently because we are actually have uh, electrical motors here that, that provide our thrust. And so we basically have uh, a setup here very similar to, to a hybrid car. Um, but the main reason we're dealing with this is because we uh, are going to, or are thriving, uh, striving to demonstrate digital twin usage across development and manufacturing life cycle. So once again, the topic of, uh, I want to look beyond my, um, development environment and want to look into, in this case, specifically assembly and uh, later phases in the life of our product. And what we are trying to do there is to leverage co-simulation with open standards to allow for ad hoc generation of digital masters, because uh, although digital masters or digital twins are highly popular topic these days, they require, similar to what we all know from simulation, they require a lot of extra effort and uh, quite often, unfortunately, stop at a point where I gather a lot of, lot of heterogeneous data, um, put them in, a, in some kind of dashboard and look at them and obviously derive some, some meaningful, meaningful conclusions, but at the same time, uh, quite often don't really play them back into a full-on systems model there. Um, or if I do, then quite often I have to basically create a new systems model that, that supports my digital twin use case there. And what we like to do here is to come up, take a bunch of descriptive models that fall out of the, um, out of the uh, development process anyway and utilize those later um, during operation or as I said, during manufacturing here. Um, so basically what we're saying, what our definition of a digital master is or digital uh, twin is, it's a comprise of a digital master, digital shadow, digital twin. Um, in that case means I have the digital master, which is the virtual modeling and simulation capability. Um, means like basically what describes my as planned uh, asset um, augmented with the digital shadow which could be field data collected, for example, by sensors. This is where we're going to the entire IoT topic. So basically the digital shadow is something that's, that's done quite a lot, but uh, actually aggregate that into a model environment is less trivial and it's not done as often in industry yet. Um, so basically, yes, this, this is where we are. We're looking at the digital master primarily uh, by building up a co-simulated environment to represent our, our example system here. 
Um, what we want to do there is this is a very, very complicated version of the V model that we quite like though, because um, it involves uh, actual production and we didn't want to go the full on uh, W or other letters that, that sometimes I use here. Um, basically what's important here are two things. It's verification um, and especially this more kind of informal um, confirmation of function and properties. So something that's, we're not talking full on design space exploration here, but something that's not necessarily formal verification, but more um, basically developers being able to, to play around and also play around in a way where they don't just like connect two of their own units or subsystems, but they also get an idea of what people down, down the line have modeled at the time or, or information that is available there to basically explore something with the later phases of the product lifecycle in mind. Um, we have a framework uh, for uh, digital twin requirements. Uh, we call this the 8D model, uh, eight dimensions of the digital twin. Uh, the first one is integration breadth. Uh, we can see basically from the inside to the outside, this is becoming a more mature, uh, basically mature development. Uh, so we're going here from integration as product and machine to the whole world, which you know is obviously more an idealized uh, goal there. I doubt that we'll ever have a digital twin of the entire world, or maybe also don't really hope for that. Um, connectivity modes are something that's of great importance here. Update frequency obviously depends on the use case. I might have something that is basically immediate real time or have something that's every week. Every week would be something like staffing information, things like that, depending on whatever is important for my use case in that regard. Um, and then CP, something that's called CPS intelligence. So uh, cyber physical system intelligent intelligence goes from human trigger to something that's basically just reacts to human interaction to automate it to partial autonomous to all the way autonomous in terms of full cognitive acting. Um, next thing would be Simulation capabilities, uh, we're going from static, which would basically something like a simple, simple playing around with parameters, seeing what happens. And dynamic would be your typical behavior simulation ad hoc, where I can basically somehow, as the user on demand, compose um, simulation scenarios and look ahead prescriptive would be something where the digital twin not only tells me how the system reacts in that or the actual asset would react and it reacts at that time, but also how it would react if I do certain experimental additions uh, to the actual data. The next thing would be digital model richness, uh, where I would start at geometry, kinematics, control behavior, and multi, excuse me, <coughs> multi-physical behavior. So also pretty self-explanatory. Um, human interaction, is also is another dimension where we go from smart devices, to, for example, an intelligent mouse, VR, AR, full vision immersion to smart hybrid, intelligent multi-sense coupling, doing some experiments there with all sorts of uh, exoskeletons, uh, some, some glove sensing um, and other things there. Um, yeah, product life cycle is something that we're looking in this example, looking at less, um, but obviously it's begin of life, mid of life, end of life, to round that up. And the um, requirements that we derive for our demonstrator here and that we identified are something that makes OSLC a good solution for us is in this case, um, scalable. So it's scalable. We could obviously, which we have done in the past and, and usually regret it a few years later, we can obviously come up with some kind of quick and dirty connection to, to throw data from one end of a, of a demonstrator or a system to the other. In this case, we would have something that is scalable that can grow with time. We can add more and more functionality depending on, on, on what kind of use cases we're working on or what kind of product projects we're going to work on. Uh, connectivity modes, object-driven param parameter exchange is something that we think OSLC can help us with. Update frequency, once again, event-driven parameter exchange. Um, obviously, real-time is something where we would use different protocols for. Simulation capabilities, ad hoc availability of parameters and requirements. That's the, that's the driver there.
Digital model richness, uh, yeah, we need a scalable model granularity. That's something that, um, yeah, I guess doesn't really relate to OSLC that much, but just for uh, make it complete. And then at some point, uh, VR, AR support for human interaction. So this would be our uh, scenario. Um, we would have a modeling tool model, model IO here, um, basically to build up a meta structure for our, for our cold simulation environment where we connect all the models together. We have a UI app here and um, <clears throat> cold simulation orchestra, oh, excuse me, cold simulation orchestration engine in the background. This modeling tool can actually generate our multi-model description. Um, this is hooked up to Papyrus. Um, to um, actually derive some of this information from the original system structure on a, on a systems level and system L. Um, Modelio actually uses a specific profile here to support this entire thing. So Modelio is not necessarily working with pure system L, it's more of a general block diagram to hook those up. Um, yeah, then we use multiple tools here. We have this uh, FMI Python interface where we can just uh, program Python code wrap it into an FMI, which is the functional, <coughs> excuse me, um, functional mockup interface. Um, so what we generate here is a so-called functional mockup uh, unit, which is a basically encapsulated uh, simulation. There's multiple, multiple applications for this. You can use it from model exchange, which means it actually includes its own solver. In our case, we have a code simulation environment. So we have the solvers running in the background. Um, yeah, we use some open modelica here, as you can see here, as a very high level description of the systems arc elements of the systems architecture. So basically, this is an entire, entire aircraft performance model, a very, very crude model, because it's just the environment for our systems system of interest. We have the battery model here in open modelica, we have the ECU for the battery to basically decide what kind of charge cycle I'm, I'm driving there. I have a range indicator just to kind of hook it up to this uh, performance model here. And then we have a propeller model and a model of the electric motor here. Um, and what we're looking for actually, in order to create this, this, this loop that I was um, talking about earlier, is that we obviously have to compare, compare to some form of requirements or some, something, some kind of concept of what is my problem space. Um, in our case, we just hooked up a GitLab to the GitLab to this, where we have requirements, uh, textual requirements in natural language. Um, we also have an interface control document um, where we have a bunch of parameters listed, um, and we're going to hook this up through uh, requirements management uh, functionality of OSLC to those FMUs in order to actually grab the output parameters that are of interest to us and compare them to the requirements and basically be able to tell uh, if I make, um, if I do uh, modify component X, Y, Z, do I still meet requirement one, two, three or not? So basically this is where, we, where we're going to create this loop. Um, what's nice about this obviously is once again, we could obviously hook it up somehow and have just some general, XMI is some other, other way to exchange data here. But since we don't really know what kind of future FMUs we're going to add to this and to expect, it's obviously very nice to have an existing standard, to have an open standard and also a standard that in our cases is free. So that's obviously nice. And especially because we usually, because we have a very diverse customer base um, to be vendor independent here is obviously one, one of the big pluses for us. So for us, OSLC provides an open standard supported by various commercial tools, but also open source solutions, as well as in-house tools that can be connected through adapters. Because usually a lot of our solutions are additions to, a, to an existing infrastructure. Um, that means for us, this is actually perfect um, because we don't have to um, come up with a new solution every time and ideally can, can basically, um, um, take advantage of an existing existing protocol and existing functionalities in the background. And as was also mentioned before, more and more tools support OSLC. Um, so that's definitely something that is an advantage for us. Um, and it also augments our FMI-based concept with a way to query data and connect uh, auxiliary lifecycle information 
so in the past in the future we might add things like um some kind of part lists things like that um just to show it's possible basically but also things that are not necessarily model driven um potentially documents things like that um if that is something that comes up um also c already supports various existing concepts like requirements management uh configuration management etc which is something that would probably also play into into uh, our environment in the future and can connect to plm and alm and customized resources can be created so this is also something where we can definitely scale again and it provides a scalable and reliable solution for traceability and linking across various tools including our own demonstrators so um this is certainly something that perfectly matches our our approach to how we use those demonstrators where they do have a life of, I would say on average, probably one to five years until uh, we somehow switch to something that's different. Um, I guess it might have been, might have something to do with the life cycle of the average uh, PhD student potentially. But um, yeah, it's something where we found it's the perfect solution for us to combine in-house tools, open source solutions, as well as commercial tools that our customers or project partners might may be using. So yeah, thank you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer.